Thank you for um, having me here. I do not have a paper. Um, instead, I have some initial thoughts um, about online violence against women. Um, so I'm going to spend pretty much the entire 10 minutes sort of contextualising this. So contextualising the problem, the human rights framework, and then end um, on where I am now, which are sort of research questions, what um, I want to investigate. So. Um, since the beginning of the pandemic, especially since March, um, there has been a vast increase in the use of technology and people going online. Uh, I think the median, um, um, since the beginning of the pandemic, uh, globally, is 77% increase in the, of using the internet. Um, so people locked down, encouraged to stay home or work from home, um, discouraged from going out and socialising with others, self-isolation because they're sick. Um, so people have moved online, particularly for work, doing day-to-day um, -day things, doctor's appointments, shopping, there's social gatherings are now online, um, and entertainment. So alongside this vast increase in internet usage was the increase in cybercrime. So we've got the increase of online scams, of ransomware attacks, um, security breaches, Zoom bombing, we now have a word for it, so people hacking into Zoom meetings and um, bombarding participants with images. Um, interestingly enough, they are usually pornographic images and usually violent, which kind of leads into what I'm going to talk about here. So over the past few months, we're starting to get some emerging picture or emerging reports of an increase in online abuse. Um, so, uh, media spotlight has tended to be on um, the risk of or the increase of sexual exploitation of children, which is fair enough. Alongside this, we've also got an increase of online violence against women, spiking during lockdown periods in certain parts of the world. So, online violence against women, just to contextualise what that looks like, um, covers it covers a vast um, number of acts um, which aim to coerce, control, monitor, silence women online. Um, it ranges from harassment to um, digital dating abuse to intimate partner violence. So on the one end you have what some would call trolling, I would call harassment, and um, they involve uh, maybe vulgar, cruel, um, violent name calling, um, particularly of a gender nature when directed at women, so think uh, calling women a slut, a whore, you're, you're a prude, um, you're not worth raping, um, the C word, so quite gendered, quite violent. This may be committed by one person alone or by many people, so sort of like a pylon or a mob-style attack. Um, more serious moving along from the trolling might be things like doxing, which is releasing your personal information online without consent, identity theft, threats of physical or sexual violence or death. Um, this can be committed by strangers to the person or by someone who's known to them and that's where we see the overlap between intimate um, uh, partner violence or family violence and, and um, online abuse. So um, image-based sexual um, abuse sort of falls in there, so if you've heard of revenge porn, but that also will include uh, um, sex extortion, um, sexualized photoshopping, cyber stalking and unsolicited dick pics, right? So this is a huge, vast number of things that when I talk about online violence against women, it's not just one thing, it's all sorts of things. Pre-COVID research showed that um, on the sort of the higher end, we're looking at about 75% of women or girls who are online have experienced some form of online abuse, um, which is often misogynistic or violent. Digital sexism is so common that if you have not um, encountered it yourself, you are considered lucky. Um, otherwise, it's, it's increasingly normalised, um, part of the course. And if you are uh, more of a public person, so the more public a woman is, the more online abuse that she will receive. Um, so the highest numbers are among uh, feminist activists, um, female human rights defenders, journalists and politicians. 
Um, even more so, um, persistence and intense um, among women of ethnic minorities, so indigenous women as well, um, disabled women, lesbian, bisexual and trans women, um, because they'll also have to deal with racism, ableism, um, homophobia, transphobia. So there's intersectional um, issues going on there as well. Um, Online gender-based violence exists in the, or arguably exists in that continuum of violence against women, both offline as well, um, a, a sort of a manifestation of deeply rooted patriarchal attitudes and gender inequality. It is not separate from that context. Um, online abuse not only harms the individual woman, so causing emotional, mental distress or anxiety, um, it can also lead to self-censorship online or avoidance of using online um, platforms or social media platforms in particular. This is a problem during a pandemic where everything is online. It's for a short amount of time or a longer amount of time. We are looking at moving to working from home more often, so this is a problem for that. Um, with fewer women participating in public life um, and thus widening that gender divide or the digital divide, sorry, between men and women, which is a global problem. So moving along to uh, the law, human rights law, what does it say about this problem? Well, it's generally accepted by international human rights bodies um, that online violence against women um, breaches many human rights. Um, and that includes the right of women to participate in public and political life, right to freedom of expression because women are less likely to go online and share their opinions, um, and not if it happens to themselves necessarily, but also that public performance of it, watching others be bombarded with online hate is going to um, lead to fewer women sharing their opinions. Um, right to be free from discrimination and violence, obviously. Uh, right to inf uh, information about health, access to health, um, avoidance of using technology for that reason, um, and right to privacy, uh, among others. So in 2018, the UN Special Rapporteur for Violence Against Women um, recognised officially that online, um, online violence uh, is a specific form of violence against women, um, and that was followed closely by the Human Rights Council. In 2019, the UN uh, Commission on the Status of Women said that online harassment um, in public spaces was a significant um, issue that states were obligated to respond to specifically within their overall duties vis-a-vis -vis violence against women generally. With regard to COVID, um, the General Assembly in September, in the September resolution, expressed their deep concern about the surge of sexual and gender-based violence. And they singled out three different categories in which states should really hone in on and respond to. One, domestic violence. Um, two, harmful cultural practices. Uh, they think female genital mutilation, early and forced marriage, that kind of thing. And thirdly, specifically, violence in digital environments. Yeah. Um, and so states had an obligation um, and they urged states to respond specifically to these three categories of violence against women during the pandemic in their response and recovery. Um, less than uh, 50 member states have addressed violence against women, particularly in their response to um, COVID-19, including New Zealand. Um, and that has almost primarily been um, around domestic violence, which is a good thing. Um, so making sure that, for example, in New Zealand, when we had level four lockdown, women could still leave the home without being um, prosecuted for that and that shelters were still available. And um, I think there was extra funding for um, services that respond to, in particular, family violence. Um, approximately zero states have um, specifically addressed online violence against women in their response policies or plans or, or in their recovery plans. So that kind of ends up where I am now. So that's the context. So my main question is why? Why are states avoiding this? Um, and you know, what do, you know, following on from what the General Assembly is saying, like what do, what do policies or plans uh, look like when they specifically target online violence against women? What does that look like? Um, and if states um, such as New Zealand are taking more of a holistic view, a gendered lens specifically towards family violence, is that enough to stem 
cyber violence against those women? Or, or do we need to take extra steps? Is it actually different enough that we need specific um, actions and what might those be? Um, and that's kind of where I am now.